Uh, yeah, man. So how, how and and how is the breeding program going? How would what is the future of the breed and what is the future of your breeding program? My perception of Jap life in Japan is that there's a, if we were to make a generalization to compare it to the U.S., there's a focus on quality rather than quantity. And you obviously are sort of space constrained. It sounds like there's maybe not a culture of owning, you know, 30, 40 dogs as a breeder. Uh, do you have systems of cooperation between breeders? How are you? Is it all in house with your program? Um, yeah, it's uh, there. Are, there are those issues. Um, we the the country is um, you know it's a lot smaller. We've got as much as we can say we've got space out here in the rural areas. Um, for most people in Japan, uh, the plots of land that we live on, even hunters, are fairly small. We don't have acres and acres of space. Um, a lot of uh, even the hunters that are out here um, still live in the city um, and might have a small yard and be able to keep like three or four dogs or something like mm -hmm. that. So there definitely is a push towards quality over quantity. Um, there will be some hunters, some larger scale hunters that have their line of dogs and have like 30, 40 dogs or something like that. Uh, but I would definitely say they're much more in the minority. Um, Usually we have a lot more small-scale breeding uh, going on and uh, a lot of cooperation. We'll have uh, breeder groups that uh, tend to have the same idea of what the dog should be and uh, usually headed by some, you know, old uh, sensei that has uh, been hunting or, you know, whatever for many years and he's kind of in charge and he's got the big vision and then we all kind of talk about things and then under his guidance kind of move through and try and create better dogs. Um, that can be said for the preservation societies as well as the hunting community here. Um, so that's basically the way we do it. We're a, lot, a much smaller scale. I've got six dogs, for instance. Um, and then my sensei, who lives about 10, 15 minutes away from me, he's got about 13, 14 dogs, I think, at the moment, Shigoku. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of cooperation and things like that. It's not breeding dogs and a line of good hunting dogs, is, as everyone knows. It's not something you can do alone. No, and, and and it sounds like it takes you know many generations, probably longer than a lifetime. Uh, is there a sort of shared manifesto in you know your group of hunters uh, under the sensei, in that your you've got a shared set of goals and you're all always collaborating and oh this dog has this I like that this dog you know. Um, yeah, we do have that um, for sure. And I guess that's part of what um, brings a group of people together here is uh, this common understanding and an agreement on like the important issues. So, uh, for instance, with uh, my Kishu program, um, the main thing when I got my first Kishu, uh, who turned out to be an amazing uh, hunting dog, um, uh, when I went to pick him up and uh, basically it, it, this is it was it's a very interesting world where um this line of dogs and uh, was a, was quite a famous hunting line of Kishu, as I said earlier, the Hosoda line. And this breeder, when I went and I said, okay, well, yeah, I'm interested in this puppy. And um, I said, so what, what are the conditions, you know, of like, you know, how much do you want for it? Or, you know, are there any stipulations you're going to put on me owning this dog? And uh, basically he wouldn't take any money. And he was like, uh, if you're trying to give me money, I don't want to talk to you anymore, kind of, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's this culture that they have of someone who they considered worthy of having their dogs they would give them their dog um, to help continue their line and they had enough respect for you as a hunter that you weren't going to mess up their line of dogs um, and so by him choosing me and contacting me I didn't ask for the dog he basically contacted me and said I have a litter of puppies do you want one of my Kishu pups um, and so it was a it was something that um, it was an honor, you know, to be asked to to, take, to be a caretaker for one of his dogs, but it came with a massive amount of responsibility for me needing to um, preserve this line correctly and to be constantly checking in with him to see, like, what we needed to be aware of. And one of the biggest things, uh, as an example, was um, to uh, breed a safe hunting dog. He said, Anzen Nainu, which is a safe dog. And... Uh, Anyone who's probably hunted with, uh, you know, hunting uh, big game dogs and things like that, especially with primitive breeds, um, you know, you can get dogs. Uh, Japanese breeds are a bit famous for having a bit of, uh, uh, we, you could say dog aggression and same sex aggression, but it's it, more of it is just uh, they they have a very uh, specific type of communication with other dogs. And when that goes downhill or 
a dog doesn't communicate well, it can lead to fights. Um, and as hunters, that's kind of the, some of the worst PR we can have here in Japan, probably, is mm-hmm. when there's okay. an accident, right? You don't want an accident. Mm-hmm. You don't want your dogs attacking livestock, people, other dogs, you know, pet dogs. So he said, the Hosoda line was famous for being a little bit, a little bit out there, a little bit dangerous. He was like, I want my, my only stipulation is that you raise him to be a safe dog, you know? Mm-hmm. And I took that as like, okay, that was my, going to be my life's goal with this dog was to make him a safe dog. Um, so there are things like that that'll bring us together. And then, um, obviously there will be, uh, in a, in a larger scale, there'll be groups that come together. that are trying to breed dogs that are a bit more, uh, have a bit more catch in them, a bit more gritty, uh, dogs that have a bit more bay in them. Um, dogs that are a little smaller, you know, there, there can be all sorts of things, but, um, we don't have like one manifesto. I would say we have a lot of groups that are breeding for, uh, different things that this group of hunters prefers. And is maybe even specific to the specific terrain that they hunt. Um, here, here where I am in Shiba, we've got the highest point we've got is 300 meters. That's our highest mountain in the prefecture. So you would think it's not mountainous, but no, it's got rolling hills. So Mm -hmm. I actually need a dog that is much more skilled. So we've got rolling hills with really dense vegetation. So I need a dog that is really good at stopping, but is not going to range too far because doing that up and down, uh, too many times. If a dog ranges out to beyond three, 400 meters of me, it's, it's kind of game over, you know? Um, and so other hunters could have a larger mountain that they're hunting and they could actually handle a dog that ranges further or need a dog that ranges further. Cause maybe they do a, a little bit more of a group hunt with five or six hunters. Uh, mm-hmm. so they want a dog that'll actually push a deer. So they'll breed for a slightly different line of, of dogs for their group. And then when we talk about breeding, we'll actually get together and talk about, okay, what is this dog? What line is it out of? And then more specifically, you know, what, what are we seeing in the line now in these, in the parents and things like that? Okay. And then we'll start uh, planning breeding. So based on that. Mm -hmm. Do you guys keep a pretty close monitor of the bloodlines of your dogs, the pedigrees? And (laughs) are you approaching any sort of genetic bottleneck with the declining population? Um, yeah, that, that is an issue for us is that, um, especially, uh, because, um, like I said earlier, most of the, the big game hunters in Japan use purpose bred mixes, um, or these gene, right. Um, heritage dogs, but that have never been pedigreed. Um, and the difficult thing with, um, with hunting with dogs that don't have pedigrees is that. If you lose, uh, you know, if an older gentleman dies and had all the knowledge up here in his head, it's all gone with him. Um, We only have as many generations as we've actually seen if it's not on paper. So it actually is a lot easier to track things if we've got it on paper. So that's something to be said for pedigree dogs for sure. Um, So in that sense, we are having an issue where the best hunting dogs in Japan for hunting big game are probably not pedigree dogs anymore. So we have a much smaller gene pool to work with when we're talking purebred dogs, but it does help us in that we can select better rather than just basing it off of one generation or two generations that we see our friend has down the road. We're actually looking further back in the pedigree and we can actually contact other people who remember seeing this dog. Um, So that's the pluses of it. But like you said, we have a, we have a dwindling population here um, and we are running into some bottlenecks and while they're still fairly healthy breeds, we are starting to see some of the, uh, you know, the kickback from a dwindling gene pool with uh, some genetic health issues that we're running into, um, smaller litters, things like that. Do, uh, are you taking outcrosses from the G dogs and mixing them in with the other breeds of Nihon Ken? Um, so that, that does happen with hunters, but then you lose your pedigrees at that point because we don't have open stud books here in Japan anymore. Uh, in the early days of the Japanese breeds, it was an open stud book, uh, to where you could bring in dogs from the mountain that you've gotten from a hunter and have them judged by judges and then added to the, uh, the registry. But because that's not allowed anymore, um, yeah, we, we, we're not able to do that, which is a bit of a drawback to trying to preserve these breeds. So we were talking about, uh, whether you guys are considering outcrosses from the G dogs into the Nihon Ken. Right. Um, and uh, I think the short answer would be that, um, that uh, originally we were able to do that. We had an open stud book at the beginning, at the early stages of the breed, obviously, of the Nihon Ken. Um, but we can't do that anymore because the stud book's been closed. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so it is something that uh, we have, you know, I think uh, some hunters have definitely thought about it. But we do have a lot of, uh, I guess, uh, pushback from the preservation side of things um, because we don't know what these, these gene or these G-dogs are actually carrying in their genetic makeup. They could have other breeds in them, Western breeds, that we don't know about because we don't have a pedigree to look at. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so it makes it a bit difficult to, to add them back to the gene pool. But we may come to a point in the future where we have to, uh, but we're not there yet, so... Mm-hmm. But so, uh, so far the outlook is okay. There's enough people doing it that you think, uh, the breed will continue. We, we talked about the essence of the Nihon Ken as a hunting dog. And I think something which is beautiful that you guys still have is you're not recreating a breed. Maybe you're down to a few numbers, but, uh, there's something authentic to you've got the real dogs and you're continuing this tradition. There's something, uh, I think doomed to failure about the attempt to recreate European breeds. You, you know, the people take a bull mastiff and they want to make it this, or they want to make that a hunting dog. And if it hasn't been a hunting dog for 150 years, you know, if a great Dane hasn't been a functional dog for 150 years, I think there's something doomed to failure. You guys are luckily not in that position. What's the outlook like for the uh, various working breeds of the Nihon Ken? Yeah, I think um, we do we do have that going for us in that we are not trying to recreate it. It's not something that has disappeared and is gone. We have a large percentage of the population of dogs that has not been bred for working or hunting anymore, so has lost a lot of their hunting ability. But we do still have this small pockets of dogs. So essentially, we're trying to preserve the whole genetic population, or as many dogs as possible, so that we have as many options because... We need, we need those outcross dogs to be able to, um, and I'm not saying uh, we're breeding outside of the gene pool, but we just need dogs that are not related to our very small uh, kennel of dogs to breed to. Um, so we do have kind of both sides where we're, we're very much in danger, though, of uh, not just losing the working ability in the breeds, uh, but of losing the breeds as a whole. Just because of, uh, again, the aging population, there's a lot fewer people in Japan that are willing to own these dogs, uh, especially in the cities, like I said before. It's a, it's, a very, it's a tall order to have a medium to large size breed and live in Tokyo City, you know, mm-hmm. uh, especially a breed that's a hunting breed and it's got the energy of a hunting dog. Uh, it needs to work. Um, and there's a lot more, I, I'd say that there's a lot more, uh, they're a lot more popular in Europe and the U.S. than they are in Japan. Uh, Mm -hmm. the medium sized breeds in particular. So yeah, we're trying, we are coming up against that wall of, of uh, a dwindling gene pool, lower number of hunters and preservationists and trying to figure out how we can connect better with the, the younger generation to actually preserve these dogs the way they should be preserved here in Japan. Mm -hmm. I think we, we talked a little bit earlier about the, uh, the the form following the function of of all dogs, and although you can create a population of uh, of these dogs in the U.S. or Europe, they will diverge from what you've got going in Japan. Similar to I think how the Akita is. Well, it sounds like the Akita in, even in Japan is a bit of a, a dilution of or a, a, a change of what it used to be. But similar to how American Akitas changed from Japanese Akitas. Uh, although it's great to get this gene pool, you know, you take the endangered rhinos from Africa, you put them in a zoo, at least they still exist, but they're not the same thing. And many generations down the line, they will not be the same thing. And so it's vital that they be, these dogs continue, uh, not just in Europe and the U S but particularly in Japan. Yeah. Um, there is a, there was a part of, uh, I guess my preser- my personal preservation effort when I got into the, the Japanese breeds and realized how close to extinction a lot of them were and how much trouble we were in. And uh, the, the immediate thing I could think of at the time, which was like 15 years ago, was uh, to get them overseas because there was more people that would own them that wanted them. There were even people interested in hunting them. I've got friends in the U.S. that hunt with Kishu. Um, but um, like you said, uh, these, these breeds uh, tend to be very... Uh, specific to Japan, uh, once they do leave Japan, um, they're going to change. The people that are doing the selection for breeding, they'll be picking different traits, different aesthetic looks, different temperament. You know, we see uh, 
we had a, a big discussion about uh, a little bit over a decade ago when there was a, a large group of uh, Shikoku breeders that definitely wanted to breed towards a, a softer temperament, a more pet-friendly, companion-friendly temperament. Um, and for our purposes here in Japan, it, it wouldn't really necessarily be the best to, uh, you know, trying to preserve a working breed, we're trying to preserve working traits. So there are things that we can correct, we understand that. And every generation is a selection process towards a better and more uh, well-rounded hunting dog um, that also throws to the, you know, the aesthetic standard that we have for the Japanese breeds. Um, and, uh, but it is, it is something that I, in the end, we are going to have to figure out how to preserve them here in Japan. Uh, we're going to have to figure out how to do that well. And if we don't, we're probably going to lose the breeds as they are. And they'll become something else, but they won't mm. be the same. 